Wow. All right, all right. We are live back at it with this week's special broadcast. I don't know what to call this. Is it a webinar? You're on GoToWebinar, but it's not going to be a typical webinar. Is it a podcast? Is it a live stream? You know, the Workplace Innovator has quite a following out there uh, from our weekly live streams. We've been a little more sporadic here in 2021, but my goal is to bring you great guests, great content, great information, practical advice for the facility management and corporate real estate leader, workplace leaders of all kinds. If that's you, you're in the right place. And my guest today is another frequent flyer here on the Workplace Innovator Show. And I'm so thrilled to have him back from deep in the heart of Texas. Welcome, yes. Rex Miller. How are you, sir? I am great. We made it through the snowpocalypse last week, so we're doing fine. You know, I looked for your update and I saw it on LinkedIn. You did not lose power, it sounds like, which is we a did fortunate not thing. Power, and, and there was a phenomenal quote that I posted on LinkedIn, you know, if 2020 was the year from hell, 2021 was the year hell froze over, at least in Texas. <laughs> Man, it was another layer to this experience we're all going oh through. Yeah. And so many of my friends, and I continue to think of them often and reach out to them often in the Houston area because I office is based in Houston. Yeah. So we have been in touch these last couple of weeks and, and many have been through some very difficult times. So we continue to be there for you folks and, and lift you up. But Today, we've got this incredible topic. It's a serious topic, Rex, and I want to yep. make sure everybody knows what we're going to cover today. We've got a full hour here with Rex Miller. Get your questions going in the Q&A box. I want to make this interactive as usual. In fact, first of all, let me know who's out there, your name, where you're joining us from across the globe, could be from anywhere. So many of our great friends from the Workplace Innovator live stream come back time and again, and I know they're looking forward to this conversation, Rex. But um, before we get too far, let me do a little housekeeping. You know, this is brought to you by, well, first of all, the topic, you know, just so you know what we're going to cover today. Return to work is this broad umbrella, but it's really return to offices. We've all been working in many ways. It's about returning to public spaces, that getting back into our comfort zone as we, uh, uh, you know, get through this next phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, it's not over by any means. We know that many have suffered. There's a tragic situation going on, mm -hmm. but you as FM and workplace leaders are trying to prepare yourselves for whatever that next normal is, the next phase of this experience. So uh, Rex published a book recently. He gave me the early, early draft of it. I'm going to show you the new cover now that it's fully complete, but that's where I got the title from. This, uh, you know, very thick uh, paperback here about a leader's guide to avoiding the mental health crisis. And those of you who know Rex, this is not a new topic for him. He is well known in our industry for sharing his wisdom around health and well being in the workplace. So we're going to really tap into his expertise today. So I'm excited about that. For those of you who are new, maybe you just joined us because you saw the topic, you saw Rex was a guest. I am Mike Petresky, the host of the Workplace Innovator podcast. Please join us every Tuesday for new episodes. This week, we released episode one. 148, Rex. We're almost to the 150 mark. What do you think wow. about that? Yeah. Uh, that's a testament to your survival, adaptability, and uh, kind of great guest. And I'm I was going to say kind of kind of insanity, my insanity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doing it every week. But no, great guest is right. In fact, this week was part two of my discussion with Dr. Tracy Brower from Steel oh, yeah. Case. I'm sure you know yeah. Tracy. Yes, I do. And she was a fantastic guest. She's a sociologist. I love the human side. I love the people side of things and practical advice. She gave a lot of it. So check out episode 148 and 147 before that if you have not already. All of these broadcasts and the content I create is with my employer here, my friends, my team at iOffice. We are four brands, one mission. We are trying to develop software and technology solutions to deliver uh, on the expectations of the occupants of our facilities. And now in the new distributed world, how do we you know, create that experience using technology across all platforms, whether you're working from home, working in an office, a corporate headquarters, or a third space. We've always called it this in recent years anyway, IXMS software, not just IWMS, but the next generation where we really emphasize the X, the experience, of our employees, of our occupants, of the people that we care for. So follow us on social media if you're not already. There, 
you will find great white papers, research reports, my podcasts, these webinar announcements, and we want to communicate with you as best we can. So check us out on all the major platforms. But, you know, I've been doing live streams and I want to start here. Um, Rex, I usually save this till the end of my live stream broadcast, but just yeah, to yeah. get the mindset in the right place. You know, I often find my escape from reality in music. And um, I was thinking about the topic today and some of the challenges we're all facing. And uh, I wanted to ask you about, you know, what kind of music is getting you through the pandemic, if any? Well, Dead Mouse right now, <laughs> a little bit of- Really? A little EDM? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Dead Mouse. You know, I use that because the beat and kind of the droning lets me really get into a flow state of content creation. So uh, that's what I was listening to this morning. Nice. Fortunately for me and you, there's no lyrics. So uh, that's all right. I could just do the background beat for this entire yeah. presentation if you want. Bam, bam, bam. Little, little deep bass. Get that going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here's my song that came across my 80s of course you know heavy mix on spotify and it's from these guys you remember the canadian band from the great white north made it big here in the 80s anybody ever know who this is that's mike reno and lover boy and of course their big hit back in the 80s was working for the weekend when that distinctive cowbell hits your your <laughs> speakers <clears throat> everybody's working for the weekend but rex i heard this song and was reminded of you know trips home from the office at 5 p.m on a friday and the oh local radio station playing this song and yeah. it was like this line of demarcation right your work day right. your work week is over and you're headed yeah. into your weekend and I don't know. Is that true anymore, folks? Is that true for you, Rex, or is it all a big blurred line? In fact, I'm going to launch a poll question here, everybody. Yeah, My favorite thing to do is get the yeah the pulse of the audience here, Rex. So I want to know about the uh, you know your standing about this working for the weekend. Is it is it something you look forward to? Do you find a difference between your your weekday life and your weekend life, or are you asking yourself often what day is it again? Is it is it <laughs> Thursday, Tuesday, Saturday, yeah. Sunday? How about you, Rex? How are you well, managing things these days? Well, prior to the pandemic, I used to ask that question because I was traveling. You know, what city am I going into? What day is it? What hotel am I in? Uh, but for the first few months, it was a blur. It was just back to back. And for me, you know, working on health and seeing what was going on, measuring it, you know, with the whoop strap and the aura ring, uh, what I had to do is create a whole new routine with boundaries. Um, one of the clients that I was working with said, what I miss is those decompression times that now we don't have any decompression. It's meeting, meeting, meeting. And um, so I've got a completely different routine and rhythm that allows me to move after every meeting to, um, to have a break in between every meeting. So I've completely redesigned and I recommend that anybody managing somebody who's working from home, help them design a new sustainable rhythm. Um, we've come up with the equivalency of work time. So if you're working and I'm hearing people working 10, 12 hours a day, you know, which to me is nuts in this environment. But yeah. if you add to it the camera time that we've got, that's like adding an additional hour to your workday for every hour and camera time in terms of the energy that it's requiring from your brain. Amazing. Uh, so if you feel worn out by 3 p.m. in the afternoon, that's why. You're not alone, folks. We're all dealing with it. Let's see how the audience responded to this poll. And look at this, just about a, oh, wow. a dead even split where yeah. we're all in different places individually. Our, our new normal here one year in to the pandemic is something that we're all experiencing. And I think we've settled wow. into many new habits and it certainly is interesting to see that result. So with that said, um, I, I also find, this is another little just distraction Rex, because I know we're trying to, you know, manage our, our stress, our anxiety, the fear, you know, just dealing with stuff. And for me, I found, as you all know, I'm a huge fan of the Mandalorian series on Disney plus Rex. I can't remember, were you a fan of this show? Yes, I am. I liked it, but I haven't followed <laughs> it in the last uh, 
couple of months, but I'm, I think I'm through season two. Well, that's all. That's the last one. So if you got to the end okay. of season two, no spoilers here, folks, but it brought me to tears. This is the way, and it's something that uh, our, our friend uh, Grogu, also known as the Baby Yoda, is somebody who uh, brings me joy each day and I find an escape. But my new recommendation, folks, if you haven't gone there yet, and I wasn't expecting to really enjoy this. I'm a fan of the MCU, but not as big into Marvel as I am Star Wars. But have you watched any of these WandaVision episodes, Rex? I have not yet. So that that's on the list. I'll tell you what, it, it, it didn't look that great to me when I saw the previews. But let me tell you, folks, give it three episodes. You'll be hooked. The whole thing in the beginning is confusing, but it's so well done. And this this picture here gives you kind of a, a, a you know, a inside look at how they do it and this is what this wanda vision is but what it's all about the reason behind it all it all makes sense you don't need to know everything about the marvel universe but uh it did just come together for me and i really enjoyed it so with that said i have another nice poll question thanks yeah in fact i'm curious to know you know how folks are managing their mental health with the isolation the you know whatever it looks like it's less as far as human interaction than it used to be i'm sure so are you using these things like music, like TV? Um, what has helped you get through the, you know, kind of experience, the quarantine life I used to call it, but here we're almost a year into this, Rex. Uh, are any of these yeah. important to you? And I let you pick more yeah. than one, because to me, I would say all of the above. I would say all of the above, but the the two things are, Kind of the meditation, prayer, and then exercise are kind of number one and two for me. Well, that's good. <laughs> you're a better man than I. I I wish those this if this was this is probably the order in which I thought of them because I'm always into music. It, it, it's my yeah. happy place. Obviously, podcast is my life, and I, I listen to a lot of other people's podcasts, as y'all can imagine. TV and movies are good. I do like it occasionally to read a book. I'm not a big book reader, but I want to thank you, Rex, for recommending this book because um you i haven't gotten deep into it but uh you shared this with me over the holidays stillness is the key and boy i, I won't give too much away folks but but it, boy it's a it's about finding that place of escape in a real way in a in a meditative you know spiritual way in a in a human way and uh thank you so much rex because it's so important yeah, that welcome. That is yeah. such a, a element that we all are craving. And I want this to be a, an honest discussion, folks, around these things. So, Rex, let me ask you, um, first of all, I'm going to tease something because you, you shared that you'd be on the show today and you said uh, two things in your LinkedIn post. You said you're happy to be back on the show, which made me happy, of course, but you're going to share with us your biggest fear for 2021 and how companies can avoid it. And then you also said you've obviously been doing a lot of work with your with your partner in crime, Jeff Jernigan. And uh, how do you say his last name? Jernigan. Jernigan. Jeff Jernigan. And you've been doing a lot of research. You've got this new book. We're going to yeah. share with the folks again here. But you're hearing one repeated message over and over again. Now, who are you talking to? Who have you been talking to? I know you're very well known in our IFMA, Cornet communities, yeah, yeah, yeah. corporate real estate leaders, workplace leaders, facility managers. But who are you talking to? That community or or broader? Yes. Yeah, no, that primarily that community, you know, the big shift for my business was instead of doing on-site live, primarily group events, it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I've been watching people kind of go through that heroic stage of the exhilaration and the adrenaline of getting into it, then kind of the lull and then social events and getting kind of setbacks and stuff like that and seeing the drain. Dr. Jernigan, by the way, is a clinical psychologist who's world renowned for studying PTSD and burnout. And um, so very early on, I reconnected with him and said, help me understand the significance of what we're going through. And from that, it kind of took us down the rabbit hole of looking at things that from an industry standpoint, we just we haven't been looking at. We've been looking at important things, but we haven't been looking at uh, the the mental well-being of the people that we're serving. And and it's even confusing as to, like you said earlier, what is our role in that, and can we be effective in helping serve that end? 
Yeah, that's exactly my mission here today. And I want this to be a practical conversation, everyone. So share your questions. I'm gonna monitor the Q&A box throughout this hour and let us know what you're really thinking. What do you need to know in a practical way as a workplace leader to be prepared for what's next? And I've got a lot of ideas, a lot of thoughts I wanna run by Rex. I certainly have uh, the desire to be helpful to people. Uh, the people I know in this community are always, you know, people first type of folks. They're they're service oriented. And if we could be a resource to them today and give that kind of practical advice, how to prepare for the future, returning to offices, the what is the future and all those things, what it's going to really look like. I want to be as transparent and honest about it as I possibly can. And we may get into some tough territory here. So just as a kind of a disclaimer Folks, you know me, you know my personality, I'm a goofball, I like to have fun, but we are talking about a very serious topic and I don't want anybody to misunderstand my effort at getting us to smile as being anything uh, to do with minimizing the seriousness of the pandemic, of the tragedy, of the loss that COVID has brought on all of us. We've all been touched in some way. In fact, I was gonna have a poll question to kick us off, Rex, where I asked, you know, what is your personal experience with COVID-19? You know, mm. do you know someone who's actually succumbed to the disease? Have you had it yourself? Uh, I was going to go through a list of five alternatives. I think everybody would check at least one of those boxes, you know, that I know somebody who's had it and right. I have either had it myself or a family member's had it, or I've had that that scary moment where the call comes in and says, hey, I just got tested and I was with you over the weekend and be on standby because you're in my line of contact tracing. I mean, put yourself in that position, folks, mentally. If you haven't right. been there, I have. It's a It's a frightful thing, isn't it, Rex? It is, yeah, and and it really, you know, there's been enough time where it comes close to home to everybody. You know, my dad's in a senior living facility in Chicago. I haven't been able to see him since last February, uh, and we can see him declining because of the isolation. I just had one of my closest friends was in an induced coma for 15 days with COVID, and mm. it's six weeks now, he's still struggling and he's, he's in his mid forties. Um, so yes, we've been, we've all been impacted. This is, there's nobody who's escaped this. It's kind of an equal opportunity, uh, hit for all of us. So with that in mind, and with that, as my understanding as well, we're all in a place right now here, late February, 2021, almost a year in, I got a feel that even though we're looking at some positive signs, the vaccines are being distributed, right. the case count hospitalizations are, are going down right now. We're seeing a, a really a, a dramatic drop there. And we have this hope that is springing eternal. Hopefully as we get into the spring, there'll right. be even more hopeful signs. But that anxiety is not going to go away, is it, Rex? There's kind of a We've been through a traumatic event. We're in the middle of a traumatic event. You said this is kind of like a 9-11 experience. We're going to have for years to right. come right. The, the fallout from that. Tell us about it. Well, and so this goes to some of Dr. Jernigan's work, and it's, it's well-known work that groups that go through either tragedy or mass disaster go through stages of psychological processing, and not everybody goes through it equally either. And, you know, my wife comes, uh, grew up in Mobile, Alabama, so that's hurricane territory. And, you know, there's hurricane watch, then there's hurricane warning. Uh, and so when you, when you know what's coming, there is this anticipation. Um, March 12th is the first time I really heard about the virus last year, and I was on spring break, you know, thinking, well, no big deal, we'll get through this. And then, boom, it, it hits. So there's this forewarning, whether it's detailed or we know what to do or not, then you get hit and impacted and everything gets disrupted. So you go through a period of time of just stabilizing and then the adrenaline kicks in. That's called the heroic stage where everybody is kind of at their best. We're just going full on. Uh, but that adrenaline stage is typically only for short duration. You know, the, right. the fight or flight mode is not meant to be sustained. It's for events. Um, that's what's unique about this. This wasn't a week. It wasn't two weeks. It was months. And so that leads into kind of that 
honeymoon. Remember last summer when we started hearing some of the big tech companies saying, yeah, we're going to bring you back in the fall. Right. Well, right. that little break or, you know, kind of eye of the hurricane stage gets you anticipating you're still a little drained, but then when you get setbacks, boom, that's when you see productivity crash. <clears throat> Excuse me. You see morale start fading. And that's what I started seeing around August, September timeframe in the coaching that people's attitudes just cratered. Um, then there are triggers, you know, setbacks. Um, and then there's kind of a bottoming out and a slow growth. But what happens is there's this residual. Um, I'm not sure if my company can take care of me anymore. I'm not sure if I'm in the right kind of work because of the impact. So trust, sure. insecurity, uncertainty plays on everybody's mind, recognizing that nobody knows what the right answer is. So that's what we're dealing with going forward is how do we help people process the experience, uh, have some stability going forward and ease the transition. So, you know, people with compromised uh, trust, uh, stress fatigue, those change management is stressful just in good times. Hmm, indeed. So, all the facilities people are in charge of change management, right? Back back to office. So that is part of my big fear for 2021 is when we start triggering, bringing people back and putting more stress, new change, routines, who wants to come in, who doesn't want to come in, um, how to manage through that. That's going to be right at the period of time that Dr. Jernigan says that whatever trauma is in place it's latent, you know, it, it stays and then it starts manifesting about six months to 18 months after it gets kind of, there's a, there's a brain thing that happens. It's called a default mode network where you're just kind of in a perpetual fight or flight mode. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of the, the challenging scenario of back to office and um, people shutting down, acting out, and the number of people who are estimated to have experienced a level one or level two trauma just blows my mind. Um, yeah. Prior to the pandemic, it was about four in a hundred in the office that had some form of post-traumatic stress. They're estimating it's going to be closer to three in 10. Um, so we've wow. never seen these numbers, you know, this kind the human side is not something facility managers are tech are trained in well. We do a great job in making sure the building is physically safe, the logistics are smooth, everything operates, but this is new territory for us. Absolutely. And there's not you know enough time today to cover all those things you just laid out and, and to give practical yeah. steps. So I want to kind of pull back a little bit and talk about just our human experiences and get everybody kind of in a place of comfort and hopefully you'll continue to join me each and every week on these webinars and live streams and on my podcast folks because i want to be a source of open dialogue authentic community and you know in order to do that we need to you know just accept the fact that we've all had this traumatic experience we're all settled in now into a new routine we our brains like rex just, rex just said our brains have been rewired for this current normal and will continue to be affected going forward and that's why I always lean on inspirational quotes. I know they don't last long. I, I always like to share these quotes on my show because for me, as Zig Ziglar said, you know, inspiration is like bathing. You need to do it daily. You need to mm. get inspiration daily. So I always lean on my marketing guru friend, Seth Godin here, and he's got a great quote. I think I might have even shared it here before early in the pandemic because I thought we were in the beginning of something that was going to trigger some of these fears and anxieties. And, and I'm going to share a couple of his quotes that relate to that because Seth's all about that default setting and where we are as human beings when we're approaching our work and what we do. And, and this just struck me, you know, appropriate for today. You know, being aware of your fear is smart. Overcoming it is the mark of a successful person. And, you know, none of us have conquered it. None of us will conquer it. And I think about success in this area, for me anyway, it's more about 
you know, embracing it in a way and leaning into it. What do you think about that balance between fear and success and, and how we're going to need to have a mindset for this in the future, Rex? Yeah, I, I think that's a brilliant quote. Then the research shows that our mindset towards, str so stress either can trigger fear or engagement. You know, it's, it, it's, it's got that. So depending on the story that you're telling yourself, it's either empowering you or it's shutting you down. So I think that's really important to check the stories that we tell ourselves, the things we ruminate in our brain and, you know, feeding the positive we got to, because the recent, you know, Dr. Ahmed Sud Mayo Clinic says that 80% of the time that we're around, our minds wander, you know, it's not focused. So this is, instead of being mindful, we're, we're not. And that indexes towards the negative. Um, so if you've got time on your hands, if you're thinking by yourself, I mean, you can probably relate to, yeah, you tend to go through the, the negative scenarios, what could happen, you know, and, and so feeding ourselves, that, you know, that's why I sent you the book. <clears throat> you know, I think, I think the first step for all of us is take care of ourselves, you know, yeah. self-care and taking care of our friends. Um, I think that's the number one step for all of us because you get sucked into the vortex, I get sucked into the vortex, and sometimes I just need somebody to tell me, hey, are you taking a break? Are you getting rest? How are you feeding your mind? Are you connecting with friends? I think that's the first mission for all of us. Yeah, remind us of your tagline, your mantra during this pandemic. You started it very early about social distancing. What did you say about that term and that expression? Yeah, I said it's really physical distancing. We don't want to be socially distant. We want to be socially connected, but physically distant and safe. That's that's what we need. And so it's unfortunate. Even the World Health Organization said it was unfortunate that we came out with that phrasing of it. <laughs> um, right. But words matter, right? The way they we do. phrase things matter. And, um, you know, I don't want to be socially distant from you. I, I want to be connected. Indeed. And yes, communication is key. And this is where we can really do some practical things. Don't yeah. let the emptiness or the lack of messaging be filled with the default in our human nature, which is negativity. Something's wrong. Something's not going to go right. And I know it's a challenging time for workplace leaders. I know you deal with a lot of executives who are, you know, this isn't about, this show today isn't about the legal ramifications of of return to office and some of the liability issues, but imagine being in a C-suite right now, making these decisions for the months to come about returning folks to the office. That's gonna be a topic for another day, but folks, I do wanna hear what you wanna hear about today, because we have Rex for this time and it's a special time. I've got a ton of questions and if you have none, I can fill his time and then some with a lot, but uh, this is an interesting topic for sure. And as Rex mentioned, he, um, or as I mentioned earlier, I'm pulling a lot of this from the research in his books. You know, there's a history of books here. If you're not familiar with Rex's work, please go to rexmiller.com. You'll find all these books as well as the brand new one, which is now available for yeah. shipping. Rex, yes, Strategy in Rebuilding. Yeah. Strategy, Strategy and Rebuilding, Principles to Building Post-Traumatic Growth. And this is your work with your co-author, Jeff Jernigan. And right. in this book, you cover some, some of your stuff you've already covered here, the, the fact that we're dealing with a mass disaster recovery ahead of us, um, why leaders are passing through the five stages of grief. You mentioned that a little bit. I want to get into some of these practical steps and, and some of the things you talk about in the sure. book, and yeah. that's around the essentials for effective management during these times of disruption, and then we'll get into returning to the workplace with confidence. So what's the what's the role and, and what do you think some of the practical steps that you know facility managers can do corporate real estate leaders sometimes I talk to my audience on these interactive live streams and they I don't feel they they feel they have the power to make much of a difference they're they're they've got the facility ready it's the deep cleaning and all those things that they're really good at and are in their comfort zone and their wheelhouse is is ready to go they've used technology to prepare people to reserve space you know they've made changes to space that's something that here at iOffice, we listen to our customer advisory board and they say we need tools to allow that level of control and flexibility that employees are going to demand. They want to be in charge of their own destiny. Yeah. But, but what else can we do in practical terms? 
Well, practically, you know, a lot of times the facility side are those people who work the long hours, uh, they respond to the emergencies. And so first question is, how are we taking care of them? You know, so we look at if we're taking care of ourselves and we're a good example of what good care looks like, then that affects other people as well. And then if we're looking through the lens of user experience, um, you know, GoDaddy is a good example of having looked at the touch points employees have from home to traveling into the office to the parking lot. And they rated those touch points as either friction points, you know, and a friction point is a, another way of saying stress point, you know, mm -hmm. like checking in and it's complicated and security or whatever. Uh, it's a neutral point or it's an engagement point. And so knowing these key touch points throughout the day, uh, they were able to go back and then redesign or rethink that experience with that. Uh, so that's another area that facilities can help reduce stress of coming in, making it easier is looking at those touch points, looking at uh, zones of connecting you know, what's one of the first thing that's going to happen when we come back? Wow, I haven't seen you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so how do we have kind of these, these, how do we have these areas where we can share our stories? Um, in the workbook, we've got uh, frameworks for sharing our stories in a safe way so that when we do come back together, um, you know, it, it's a workbook. So there's some reflection and there's some group things you can do. But part of it is we're different people coming back. And so different kinds of zones are needed. We also know that space has a lot to do with culture. And if you think of culture as the invisible uh, values, attitudes, habits, and behaviors, those have all changed. So now we right. have to re rethink through and, and space is a proxy for what's important to us. Um, that that's another word way of saying value. So rethinking what's what's the what are the new important things to us, to our collective experience, to work and rethinking that. So those are some of the ways that if I'm in facilities or in design, I'm rethinking through the environment through the experience side of the lens. Absolutely. And if we can make that as frictionless as possible. That's my favorite word. It's like, yeah. you know, hopping into a, a bed with satin satin sheets wearing silk pajamas, <laughs> Rex. Frictionless experience is what it's all about. So if we could bring the technology tools and the strategies yeah, to yeah. the table. In fact, it reminds me of a, a poll I saw in a recent IFMA webinar. I'll just share it with you all here. Um, and, and this is what is going to be important, you know, according to uh, our, you know, real people talking to each other. I think this was Workplace Evolutionaries webinar a, a month or so ago. And the question was, what will be the main responsibility for FM post vaccine? And number one is there, ensure health and safe workplaces. And then number two, right close behind it is improve employee yeah. engagement and experience. And then another question came up and they asked, what is the main business driver for FM post vaccine? And again, it's all about your, your wheelhouse here, Rex, you know, Right. Employ deployment and uh, development and deployment of a new workplace strategy and right. a focus on employee health and well-being. Any comments on these survey results? Yeah, well, they make sense. I mean, the f number one job is, you know, that companies are going to expect facilities people to do is make sure that it's safe, uh, that the protocols are in place to physically distance, uh, the cleaning regimen, all of that. Um, it's interesting that improving engagement and experience is as high as it is. Um, I, I'm, I'm, that's a positive sign for me to see that we're owning that as facility managers. And then the deployment of works. So that's the big question. What is the strategy going to be, you know, and, and what's the ratio and how do we acclimate people to kind of that, the new work rhythms. I don't want to use the word, the new normal, but the new work rhythms mm -hmm. uh, that we have. I like that term too. And that webinar probably was the Workplace Evolutionaries community of practice within IFMA. Yep. So 
folks, if you're not familiar with the WE community and you're an FM or a corporate real estate leader, it's a great place where some very smart, forward-thinking consultants and, and practitioners are gathering to have these conversations around strategy and the new role for you in the future. So if you want to really upskill and learn and be prepared for what's next, I encourage you highly to get involved with WE. So Rex, this last yep. half of our time together, I really want to spend on the return to office. I know we called this yep. return to work, but that's just a a challenge because that's another one of those phrases that was right. established early on, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So returning to offices, let's let's really get a, a gut check from the audience here. I have a I have an audience poll question, and I'm curious because we set the stage here that at this moment in time, and we've been through these surveys before. We we talked about returning to office at the very beginning of my live stream in the March, April, May of 2020 time frame where we said, when will you return to your office? In late May, June, July, and then it became, as you mentioned, the fall, yeah, and then it became the right. first of the year, and here we are, and, and not much has changed, except we do now have a vaccine. And for many of those stages, I kept hearing my audience tell me, Mike, post-vaccine, it'll be a different world. It'll be a, a whole new ball game. We're waiting for the vaccine. We're following the science. That was other phrase we could have a whole conversation about because Science is not a destination, it's a process, and I have strong opinions about that phraseology. But let's ask the audience, what changes when this vaccine really gets out there and you get yours? I know we've all had different um, experiences. I was gonna ask about you know, what's the personal uh, situation with the vaccine. I, my parents have gotten their second dose today, so they are you know, nice. almost through the process. My in-laws the same. So any of the older generation that we interact with, they've got their vaccine and they're, according to the, the effic efficacy rates, is that the term? They're going to be very protected. But look at these options and select more than one if you'd like. But what will you do differently, folks? This is my question. Rex, I'm going to ask you this too. When hmm. you get your vaccine, what will you do differently, if anything? And does does anything change really after the vaccine? And at least in the near term, some will say nothing will change for me. Some will say I'll resume visits with family and friends. Those seniors that we mentioned, your your uh, parents and mine, and and those that are uh, been yeah. isolated, we get to you know hug them again and get back together. Maybe this will be the cue. You get your vaccine, you're going to return to the office. Um, you'll feel comfortable traveling again, getting back into more public spaces, or maybe you don't plan to take the vaccine. This is a question again, not to be controversial, but in the audience probably has different opinions, but some will not take the vaccine. There's going to be this uh, group of folks that have not been vaccinated. But assuming you either are vaccinated or you're, you're uh, decided not to take the vaccine and you're going to um, move on uh, with your life, what does that look like? And just like I thought, we got a pretty broad differential here across the different categories. 36%, uh, nothing will change in the near term. Um, and then the return to office, Rex, let's focus on that because that's what I wanted to set this conversation up as for the second right. half. Only 18% will return to their office. What do you wow. think about that piece? Yeah, it, uh, on one hand, it stands out. That number stands out. And on the other hand, I think there, you know, it's a multi-layered response because part of it is people have gotten used to and feel effective, you know, working from home and they'd rather probably just ride it out until it's absolutely safe, not take the risk, but also people are starting to like, you know, this this work from home. So I think that's part in that number. Um, you know, the first thing I'm gonna do is get on a plane and visit my dad. Um, and that'll be number one. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So we've done a lot of research on the nature of the virus. By the way, I'm gonna recommend a book for every facility manager to really understand the depth of the science behind what we do know about this virus. And that's Nicholas Christakis's book called Apollo's Arrow. It's, it's a little wonky, uh, but really gives you a solid grounding in understanding the nature of pandemics, uh, what we can look for going forward, the nature of the coronavirus, and um, so it explained a lot and it goes through the whole timeline of the virus too. That was one of the most interesting, helpful things for it's me. It's available I, as an audio book. That, those deep yes, dive it books. Is. I, I listen to it as audible. I can't, excellent. I don't have the excellent. time to just read a book book. I'm too slow yep. a reader. 
Uh, I love podcasts. But, so there's some great conversations around those types of, you know, really philosophical and deep dive conversations. So if you're not listening to podcast folks, not just mine, but there's plenty out there where there are people having these conversations. Right. It's very helpful because it gives you information and information is power. But the knowledge that we gather can be overwhelming at times. And then all of a sudden it becomes, what do we do with that knowledge? I, I heard a quote just on a recent interview. It hasn't been published yet. One of my favorite quotes, and I, I'll butcher it here, Rex, but the idea of around all this knowledge is one thing, but knowledge without application or proper application is foolishness. It's, it's wisdom comes from the proper Doing. application of that knowledge. Yeah. Right. And I'm, I know somebody said it better than I just did, but with that in mind, and, and I want to go right into another poll question here and, I, and get your thoughts. You can share your thoughts on that as the poll goes up. But, yeah. you know, there's a lot of data running around and there's a lot of information being tossed back and forth. And I saw, as I assumed I might, in our first question around returning to offices or returning to public spaces, even after people have the vaccine, Rex, only 18% right. said yeah. they'll go back. And then there was less than half that were saying they're going to re-engage with travel and re-engage with family. And so forth and so on. So my next question is, all right, what will make you return to some offices or some public spaces? What data will you be looking for? And I should be, what data, yeah, did I say that right? Data is, data are. What data yeah. are you looking for yeah. before returning to offices? So we've got these declining uh, stats in, in case counts and hospitalizations and deaths. Do you see, need to see that go down even further? You're looking for the vaccination rates of among the broader society. Do you need that herd immunity to be declared that, what is it, 60 to 80 percent somewhere in there need yeah. to be vaccinated or have had the a virus to be, quote unquote, in herd immunity stage? Um, are you going to wait and see what happens? The office, you know, people are welcomed back. What, what do your colleagues do? How's that interaction going with some folks in, some folks still remote? Are you waiting for COVID to go away completely? or you're already there. This doesn't apply to you. In fact, I know that some in our audience are probably even watching this from their workspaces, their offices, and there has been, although very low levels of, you know, in-person uh, office uh, activity, there are some that are already out there. And I have a comment about that in a second. But, but Rex, what are your thoughts on this poll and, and how would you respond? What are you looking for? Well, so here's a couple sources I look at. I typically look at the New York Times map on the coronavirus, and I specifically go to deaths per capita. That's the primary one I look at. Um, to me, that's that's the telling one. I look at the Johns Hopkins site as well, and um, and when you look at the numbers, uh, you know if you have an underlying health condition, then you're really at risk. Uh, supposedly, you know, at 66 years of old, age, uh, I'm in that risk category. However, my health is good. And so when you look at the mortality rates, um, over 80% of the deaths have been those over 60 years old. Uh, and more than 80 plus percent have had either some kind of underlying health condition, either uh, a chronic disease um, or obesity or some other kind of underlying health condition. So from a risk management standpoint, you take that into consideration and you look at, okay, what is the risk involved? Um, and, but also recognizing that this is a very unpredictable virus. You know, if, if my 44 year old friend can be, uh, you know, put in an induced coma for 15 days, then, you, 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 it's not something you take lightly. Yeah, it's what's but, made it so scary is those anecdotal cases and they're, they're absolutely tragic for those right. that are involved. But if, if you are a data guy and I'm a data guy and we, we try to balance those with the broader statistics, you said there are some things we know yeah. that are, are for me, you know, statistically yeah, for me accurate. Personally, but, I, but, for me personally, I'm comfortable traveling. I'm comfortable doing workshops as long as we physically distance and we wear masks. I, I did a workshop a couple of weeks ago, my very first one, and you know, a little bit of apprehension going out, but it was fine. Everybody behaved. We were physically distanced. Uh, we took up about three times the space for a workshop that we normally do. Okay. Uh, it wasn't ideal, but it was certainly a lot better than doing this thing for, for a sure. full day. 
Yeah. So that was your first time doing a in-person workshop. Since since February of last year. Yeah. It was last year. Three weeks ago. Yeah. And and now you probably feel you probably had a lot of hesitation, a lot of anxiety heading into it. But now that you've done it, will it be easier the next time and the next time after oh, that? For me, for me, the, just for me, knowing my health, um, knowing my carefulness and making sure clients follow certain protocols, I don't have any problem doing it. I'm comfortable. Um, yeah. But that's my. Yeah, exactly. It comes down to each of us as individuals. And right. I think where we are today is, you know, interesting because you've said it already, our brains have been rewired. We've right. processed all the information we've gotten, good data, bad data, information, misinformation, and we've come to kind of a place and we've decided this is our new normal, whatever that is, our new comfort level, our baseline now going forward. And that's why I asked the question about what changes after the vaccine and I, I didn't. I shared the results, but just to, let me throw them, up, throw them up again, just so we can yeah. look at them. But, but what's interesting is that it looks like the vast majority of folks are. I can't restart the poll. Sorry, but, but I'll ask a new poll here in a question. But most people it look like over 75% said we're waiting for herd immunity. And yeah, but that's, see that when the, does that happen? Yeah, yeah that's the question. That's going to be mid to late 2022 before that happens, according to some of the research I've read. Uh, you take into consideration that up to half the population is reticent to get the vaccine to begin with, and then the time and the learning curve and then building up that herd immunity, um, it's still a little bit of a of a guessing game. And a, and a good percentage of the poll respondents, I think it was 15%, said they're waiting for COVID to go away completely before re-engaging. And Rex, yeah. what do you think the chances of that are? I think, I mean, again, we right. don't know. We don't know what we don't know still here right. a year in. And what I do know is that the virus is starting to mutate. And I think that we will see variants of this uh, for a long time to come. I, I do too. I'm I'm in Bill Gates's camp when he says that, you know, the conditions are still there for new variants to, to uh, happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been warned for over a decade that it's possible. Um, and now we know. So, well, here's a question I debated on what timeline to put this under because you mentioned mid 2022. I thought about let me put it out even further five years down the road and I settled in on three years. So everybody okay. out there, tell us what you think the future really will look like wow. in three years from now. OK, and with all that said, you know, maybe you are you know, a realist or a pessimist or a, a pragmatist where you say not much will change. We have these set new expectations or standards as individuals and those that feel comfortable being out and engaged will continue to do so. Those who are not will continue to, you know, continue to stay um, protected. Um, I've heard the other extreme. Humans have a very short memory. And in, in, by three years from now, even if COVID is still around, people will will see everybody re-engaging with, with normal life and we'll be back to our old habits, you know, and that we, this is not specific to the workplace and offices, but I'm curious about the general perception out there. Uh, somewhere in between, it depends on the individual. I, I kind of mentioned that, we've talked about that. The, we'll continue to try to protect the older folks and, and those are most vulnerable and they'll continue to, you know, play it safe where others will be out more um, yeah, comfortable. And you can answer more than one. Oh, shoot, I, I meant to say this could be more than one option, but now you got to choose just one, folks. Sorry about this. COVID will be gone completely or COVID will be with us indefinitely. I meant to have you have multiple choice here. So this is going to ruin my results, but I'll share them real quick and get your comment on this, Rex, see what people say. And uh, sure enough, with a, with a single choice, that's probably your best choice, somewhere in the middle. I was hoping to get a, a broader yeah. perspective, but you uh, have any comments on the way I what I was trying to get at with this question. Did I, I did I get my point across? Yeah, so here are two things that I think that need to be factored. One is that pandemics like the, or the virus is going to continue, take new forms, so that's here. But the vulnerability of the US population, and this was in the book, The Healthy Workplace Nudge, that somewhere between 70% of the US population either has a chronic disease or is um, obese. That's the vulnerability point. So that to me means that 
the number one strategy is rebuilding health and resilience. That's the long-term strategy. Rebuilding health and resilience, recognizing that wellness programs don't work, so we have to do something different than that. Um, to me, that's the long-term strategy. That's the antidote to susceptibility to things like pandemics. Wow, I just looked at the clock, the clock, Rex, and time is going away way too fast. We got yeah. 10 minutes left. I, I do want to open it up to some questions, but sure. really practical. What didn't we cover? Did you tell us your biggest fear? You already mentioned it is the, the yeah, fact yeah. that we're going to get back in and we're going to have this wake up trigger, call, right? Trigger the trauma. Yeah, it's going to trigger the trauma, the latent trauma of up to 100 million Americans are considered to have either a level one or level two trauma. So, you know, that's coming back to the office. And the thing you've heard most in your research is what? I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. Mm -hmm. When's it going to end? Am I in the right job? And then the other interesting thing is it has, uh, it has made the differences in people's work styles more dramatic. So there's more collisions, more misunderstandings. More, and, and that would just seem logical because there's a lot you gain just in the proximity of interaction that you lose doing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about any practical advice that we haven't touched on yet? I want to make 2021 the year of being of service to our audience and saying, you know, how do you better care for yourself, your people right. and your workplace? Yeah, I, I would, the number one recommendation for a facility manager is to take a, a broader role in the change management experience. It's the largest change management experiment in history. And there's a psychological component that we're not usually, you know, attuned to. I would recommend getting some input from the psychologists in the area that understand burnout and trauma and help design the process that takes that into consideration. That's the number one thing I would recommend. Number two is take care of yourself, your team well. Um, and, uh, and so those are the two top recommendations. Awesome. Yeah, great stuff. I appreciate that and concur. And practically, folks, we need to be in a mindset prepared for what's next. And I have a great yep. story I want to reiterate if you didn't hear it. Rex, did you see I had... Kay Sargent on again a couple of weeks ago. I did. She's awesome. Yeah. She talked about the workplace and is this our Kodak moment as the workplace, right. you know, because if we ignore all these things that are happening, you know, we might wake up in, uh, you know, a few years and find out the workplace, someone else has come along with a solution to this, you know, managing our anxiety and fear and, and putting it all together in a better way. So as workplace leaders, we need to really take that seriously. She asked me 10 questions of things we can do to make sure we're adapting and going through that change management that we should be focused on. And it, it challenged me. But one thing that she said, it was a practical story and, and she's a big football fan. And she mentioned a story from uh, Willie Galt, which I believe was a wide receiver for the Chicago bears back in the eighties. Yeah. And, and really quick, the story was he's at the super bowl. He's in the end zone just with his eyes closed and, and, and standing there while others are running around doing their pregame routines. And a reporter came up to Willie Galt and said, Willie, what are you doing? You know, you're about to play the biggest game of your life and you're sitting here in the end zone with your eyes closed. And he said, I'm envisioning that big pass happening in the game at a critical moment. Maybe it's right. the end of the game. It's the time when I need to catch that pass to make the big difference in this game and I want to be ready and I don't want to hesitate when it happens. So by going through that mental process of envisioning it and be prepared, it's a great sports analogy. I'm sure you've heard it many times in your research where you visualize what's going to happen right. Right. And, and be ready for it. So what are you preparing for folks? What in the, my final poll question here, you're in your end zone, you know, the, the not post COVID end zone, but the next phase of COVID, end zone and what is it that you need to be envisioning now to be ready for when the time comes rex said it when he went on that first plane ride during the pandemic and he went to his first in-person you know um presentation it was a little scary but the next one will be easier and the next one after that will be easier and, and i think we we have to prepare ourselves just like that first trip to the grocery store you many of you had 
But what, what is your end zone, Rex? Is it going to be returning to an office and working as an individual, staying away from everybody? Will it be sitting in a conference room with a bunch of people? Will it be getting on that airplane? Will it be uh, going to one of our conferences, IFMA's World Workplace or the Cornet Global Summit? They're both expecting to open up back in-person conferences this fall. They're hoping to. Or will it be, you know, going to a concert or a sporting event, you know, getting in some kind of a big public setting like we used to and being ready for that, being comfortable for that? So what would you do to answer this question, Rex? I know you've already done a couple of these. Yeah, so it's interesting. I love the analogy because in my life, I'm in my fourth quarter, you know, 66 years of age. How do I finish well? And no, no, mid 40s, I was going to guess. <laughs> and so the the kind of work I do is really shifting to how, how to help people become the best version of themselves each day. And so what are the new routines and the disciplines and the habits to do that consistently because that's what we're all here to do is we've got this limited time and this potential and we got to show up and play but what is the game and the game is to be the best version of who we can be and to serve the other people around us so that's that's what I spend my first part of my more every morning thinking about what's that going to look like today Excellent advice. And that's really something we all need to do. I know I have been stuck in my home here for almost a year, folks. My pre-pandemic routine was every week, every other week on the road, traveling on airplanes, speaking to you at IFMA chapters everywhere, going to the big conferences, going to the trade shows. And I've adapted. I've adjusted. I don't yeah, like it too. in a lot of ways, as we've we've discussed. It's not great, yeah. but I've I've gotten to a point where this is my reality. And I talk a big game, Rex. I say once I get that vaccine, or even once the even once the case counts go down, um, and and it becomes more of a, a settled thing where where the risk is relatively low, I feel like you. I, I I feel I'll be comfortable getting on a plane and going somewhere again. But all talk and no action is the is the thing I'm trying to yeah, let yeah. you all know behind the curtain. I don't know how I'm going to react, and that's why that visualization of of whatever that is, and, I, and the results of the of the end zone question, where I'll cross the board. Everybody's got their their target in mind, and and preparing for it now is something that we all can do, so we're ready mentally. And then I think once we do it and do it again and again, it'll get easier and easier, and we will get back to a comfort level. Um, but it's going to be hard, and some of us will will have a harder time getting there than others. So, in these final uh, minutes, I, I don't have time for many questions. I apologize, folks. I, I appreciate you checking in here. Evan, your comments are always appreciated. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, Lori asked about the name of that book again. Can you share that with with us one more time? Which one? Uh, Stillness is the Key by Ryan Holiday, or the new one on the website is Strategy for Rebuilding. And I think so, you mentioned a third. You had a, another author you recommended that we were talking about the oh, audio book. Nicholas Christakis, uh, uh, the Ap Apollo's Arrow. Apollo's yeah. Arrow by Christakis. Yeah. How do you, and um, and check -R -I -S -T -I -K -A -S that out. R-I-S-T-I-K-A-S is Greek. Perfect. All right, folks, I've got one more inspirational quote from our pal Seth Godin to send us on our way. And I think it ties everything together here, Rex. Let me know how you think I did okay. or how, how Seth did. And this was something he said before the pandemic. But if you are deliberately trying to create a future that feels safe, you will willfully ignore the future that is likely. And let that yeah. settle in. The fact is, I don't think, and even if it does, if COVID went away tomorrow, there's something else that we will be, you know, encouraged to be fearful of. There's there's information overload. The media is is in the business of selling fear, getting us anxious, getting us to tune back in for the next, you know, episode of whatever they're trying to offer. So once you get the good data, once you know the protocols, once you know how you can live your best life safely. You know, don't expect all those things to go away. We have to get back to the pre-pandemic. And this is a pre-pandemic quote. You know, COVID may be out there for, for years to come, decades to come. You may have to get a flu shot booster and then also a COVID-19 booster each each fall. And whatever that looks like, the sooner we accept what reality is, uh, the better off we'll be. What do you think, Rex? Close us out. So I'm going to connect The Mandalorian with Ryan Holiday and the title of one of his books. 
the wow. obstacle is the way. The obstacle is the way. Uh, that's Stoic philosophy. That um, you know that that your mindset is. You take whatever comes. You play the hand that's dealt, and that you focus on. You know, you know the difference between what you can control, what you can't control, and you focus on what you can control. So, anyway. I love it. I love it. Perfect. A little deep philosophy to wrap things up. Thank you, Rex, for another incredible contribution to this broadcast. Thank you all for being here today. If you have any questions, please reach out to me on social media, or you can email me at podcast at workplaceinnovator.com. Thank you for supporting the show and these broadcasts. It's always a pleasure and an honor to speak with these industry leaders. So until next time, I hope that this hour, in some small way, encourage you all to be a workplace innovator. Thanks, Rex. You're Peace welcome. Peace out, everybody. Take care.